We have got ourselves a 240Hz 1440p W OLED. It's the Asus ROG Swift OLED PG27AQDM. Aside from its elongated name, it has a 26.5 inch form factor and at the time of filming and in the UK can be found for roughly £1,100. In this review, you're going to be seeing if it's actually worth its price tag and if it really lives up to the marketing by being a real endgame monitor. Now to kick off, I would like to point out something quite important. And here, if you do want to achieve the maximum refresh rate and resolution, you'll have to be plugged in over DisplayPort. There's only a singular DP 1.4 with DSC. Indeed, if you do connect over the HDMI 2.0 ports, you'll be oddly limited to 1440p at 120Hz, despite the HDMI 2.0 spec being actually capable of hitting 144Hz. I'll touch upon why further down in this video. Now with that in mind, I had this monitor connected over DisplayPort to my RTX 3080, and here the monitor's input lag was objectively tested at 0.5 milliseconds. Indeed, it is pretty much as close as you can get to a CRT. It is absolutely impeccable. Here, the mouse clicks that I was experiencing subjectively while playing a game like CSGO was absolutely perfect. No complaints whatsoever. Similarly, when it came to the monitor's response time via the OSRTT tool, I noted an average initial time, which translates to average D2D, at 0.74 seconds. I can't stress how ridiculous this number is, and indeed the same sort of experience I had while reviewing another OLED screen, more specifically a QD OLED from Philips. Frankly, over here, when it comes to the monitor's input lag and response time, it is really class leading. Pair that up with the 240Hz refresh rate, which is the first that I've come across, at least when it comes to an OLED, it makes for an absolutely excellent experience, at least when you're playing some hardcore competitive games. Furthermore, thanks to its OLED technology, this Asus monitor has got absolutely no inverse ghosting, be it at its maximum refresh rate or indeed lower refresh rates. Here you can see via the UFO ghosting test that there is no sort of purple trailing or indeed any sort of inverse ghosting. However, you will note that there is no MBR or motion blur reduction. Here, it's quite a shame because, in my opinion, Asus is really renowned for the likes of ELMB Sync, which is using MBR technology simultaneously with adaptive sync technologies. Nonetheless, the motion clarity at its maximum refresh rate of 240Hz was pretty good, at least in my opinion. So moving swiftly on, we get onto adaptive sync technologies. And here, this monitor does not have a native G-Sync module and therefore has a VR range from 40 up to 240 hertz. Now, while connected over DisplayPort to my RTX 3080, I was able to run the NVIDIA Pendulum demo. And in this respect, I didn't incur any sort of black screen issues or flickering. However, it is worth noting that when I went outside of this and went into, let's say, a game like Destiny 2, with or without HDR at 1440p at 240Hz, I suddenly noticed quite a bit of flickering. And this was mainly on the static menus. However, when I was playing the game itself, it didn't seem to be an inherent issue and didn't really throw me off of my overall gaming experience. But it's just food for thought, because here, while I recently reviewed a Philips QD OLED, I didn't seem to incur the same sort of VR flickering, and therefore means if VR is very important to you, then you might want to look at some of the alternatives out there that potentially subdue the overall effect. Building upon that point, the overall HDR experience was subpar, at least in my opinion, having recently reviewed a Philips QD OLED. Now don't get me wrong, this Asus OLED screen looks absolutely phenomenal in comparison to an SDR image, because the overall peak brightness that one can attain over HDR is far superior than one can attain over SDR. Furthermore, the contrast ratio of OLED technology is inherently better in comparison to, let's say, LCD screens, even ones with mini LED structures and have got HDR 1400 certification, for example. However, when it came to the overall color accuracy and the customization of the different HDR preset modes, it was pretty disappointing. See, flicking through the different HDR modes didn't seem to impact the overall HDR image, and furthermore, the fact that this monitor has actually got a matte coating to it, it meant that it really couldn't compete with the glossy panel of the Philips QLED that I'd recently reviewed. 
Now, sticking on the subject of VR technologies, this monitor will actually run those technologies also over HDMI. And this is not something that I immediately clocked, but shout out to Adam from PC Monitors and Simon from TFT Central for actually pointing it out to me. Indeed, over here, over HDMI, you can run VR technologies, which will certainly be appreciated for console gamers. On that note, here console gamers will be pleased to know that over HDMI you can run 4K 60Hz or 120Hz at 1440p. Indeed, while connected over HDMI, it seems to be going onto a console mode as such. Asus really wants users to benefit from the full max refresh rate and therefore use the display port, therefore with a PC. If, however, you're using the HDMI ports, then you're really going to be limited to console usage, because PC gamers could have potentially achieved 144Hz over said connection, but unfortunately will not be able to due to the firmware limitations that Asus has implemented. Speaking about optimizing the monitor, let's talk about the fringing effect. Now this is inherent in cross all OLED technology, but having recently reviewed a Philips QD OLED, I didn't notice it to be an inherent problem. Unfortunately, it seems to be a lot more problematic on WOLED technology, which is exactly what is being used on this Asus monitor. Therefore, the sub-pixel layout is slightly different. Now, shout out to Adam from PC Monitors, who actually chatted to me about his own experience about fringing, because he actually owns the Alienware QD OLED. Now, in this respect, when I first plugged in this Asus monitor, it is pretty much the first thing I noticed. Text looked completely off, so much so that it somewhat gave me an odd feeling while looking at the monitor. I look at a lot of text due to me being a journalist and owning my own publication, which is called Totally EV, in case you're interested in fully electric or hybrid reviews, do check it out down in the description below. But in this respect, it meant that I wasn't really comfortable using the monitor. It's not until Adam pointed out that you should actually disable clear type on, let's say, OLED technology, specifically, let's say, on W OLEDs, in order to reduce the fringing effect. Indeed, this is somewhat of a lack of optimization from Windows, less so about the panel manufacturers. So therefore, at this given point, the WOLED technology means that you're either going to have to have text with a little bit of shadows behind it, or text that really looks a little bit odd in comparison to anything that you've ever seen before on a PC monitor. Now, just to put it into perspective, I compared this Asus W OLED with my AOC AG275 QS, a 300 Hz IPS that runs 1440p. The differences were really clear to my eyes, and hopefully, you'll be able to see for yourself the differences when it came to the pictures. Now, some people might care more or less about it, but for me personally, it was really a deal breaker. I can't really see myself using this monitor on a day to day basis, specifically if I've just splashed out £1,100 on it. And yes, again, it is not exactly Asus's problem, but it is a limitation of WOLED technology. So, therefore, it's something that you should really be concerned about if you're getting this monitor not just for gaming or movie consumption. Now past all of this I would also like to raise a bit of awareness when it comes to the OLED limitations and by that I mean when it comes to the overall burn-in effect. Here this is not something that some people will be accustomed to when it comes to regular LCD LED displays but it's something that you should be mindful about when it comes to looking at any sort of OLED screen be it QD OLED or W OLED like we have on review. Now, thankfully, all of the manufacturers, including likes of Asus, have implemented certain technologies in order to mitigate the effect. Here, through the monitor's OSD, you'll be able to enable or disable screen saver, pixel cleaning, screen move, adjust logo brightness, and also enable or disable the pixel cleaning cycle reminder. Now here it is worth pointing out that the pixel cleaning will have to occur after a set number of hours and therefore means that you will have to use the monitor and just be mindful of it that after a certain amount of time it will require a pixel clean but this will only take less than 5 minutes. Now it is also worth highlighting that in comparison to some other QD OLEDs or even in comparison to some other W OLEDs out there, you will not have to do a full panel refresh, which is a far more intensive cycle. Now having reached out to Asus about it, they've actually mentioned that they don't actually require it because they feel that the overall pixel cleaning will suffice in order to keep the panel pretty refreshed and therefore prevent you from having any sort of burn-in effect. 
Furthermore, they've got a pretty beefy heatsink, at least according to the marketing, which therefore means that it should also mitigate the effect and therefore keep the temperatures low of this W OLED screen. So past all of this, how does the monitor actually perform when it comes to overall color accuracy? Now here, the monitor has got a dedicated sRGB emulation mode that you can enable through the OSD, which is certainly appreciated. Better still, it doesn't also lock the brightness. Now in here, in said mode, via my calibrators, I noticed an impressive gamut coverage of 99.9% and a gamut volume of 107.8%. You can see below how it compares to the sRGB standard. Now as a result of this, the average Dell TE and maximum Dell TE sit at 1.02 and 2.44 respectively, which is seriously impressive, and therefore this monitor can be used for any serious image or video grading work. The tested contrast ratio due to its panel technology sits at an infinity to one, and as for the measured white point in comparison to the target, it sat at a pretty impressive 6684 Kelvin at 100%. Although you will note that the gamma coverage is slightly odd, specifically towards the higher and lower tones, and indeed over here seems to be quite off the 2.2 standard. Now if you want to get a little bit of extra pop from the monitor, you'll want to run it outside of its sRGB mode. And in this respect, on its racing mode preset, with the gamma set to 2.6 on the OSD, I actually noted a very impressive DCI-P3 coverage. Here you can see that the gamma volume and coverage have been increased across the board, and below you can see how it compares to the DCI-P3 standard. Equally, the color accuracy at an average delta of 1.62 and a maximum of 3.92 in comparison to the DCI-P3 standard is seriously impressive. The contrast ratio doesn't change, and as for the measured white point, it is still very impressive at 6723 Kelvin at 100%. As for the gamma curve, it's relatively close to the 2.6 standard, although it's a little bit off in certain areas. So what about when it comes to the overall brightness of this monitor? Well, here in HDR, I noted a peak of 959 nits, and indeed it does get pretty bright. In SDR, with the uniformity on mode, it gets to 250 nits. With it disabled, however, it will get between 301 nits and 180 nits. I really do love the uniformity on function because it means that when you are shifting between different screens, the monitor is not dynamically adjusting its brightness, which can be somewhat off-putting. Better still, you've also got a minimum brightness all the way down to 21 nits, showing absolutely excellent range. Now with the uniformity mode enabled, you can see that the brightness uniformity of this monitor is absolutely excellent. I do appreciate it's somewhat pan lottery, but nonetheless I'm sure you'll get a similar experience. As for the backlight bleed, well it simply isn't present in the slightest, and that is thanks to the OLED technology that's being used, and therefore means you'll get a completely pitch black image, which is very ideal if you're consuming let's say movies, or indeed watching any sort of darker scenes. Now past all these tests, I would like to talk about the aesthetics, and this monitor looks absolutely spectacular thanks to its really thin profile and its completely frameless design. This means that it won't take up too much space on your desk. Speaking of which, the built-in stand provides you height, tilt, pivot and swivel adjustments, all of which are certainly appreciated in order for you to get the best sort of ergonomics. Of course, if you do not want to use the built-in stand, you can replace it via Visa compatible stand. Although it is worth noting that if you do choose to keep the stand, then you will see a logo projection at the bottom of it. You can customize it to a certain degree, although I do find it somewhat pointless. In my case, I actually had it fully disabled. Equally, the RGB lights at the back of the monitor don't actually serve a purpose. It's nowhere near as effective as the likes of Philips Ambiglow. So therefore, you'll probably want to navigate to the monitor's OSD, which can be done via a little joystick button found underneath the monitor and towards the center of it. Here you'll find a plethora of different settings that you can adjust, and indeed the menu system is very intuitively laid out. So kudos to Asus for this. Now here you will also notice that there is a volume setting, although this monitor does not have any built-in speakers. Instead, this is referring to the audio output that you can have via the built-in 3.5mm jack, therefore if you're plugging any sort of headphones. On that note, it does also have two USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type-A ports, handy if you want to plug in a USB flash drive or of course your peripherals. 
So with all that in mind, it brings me on to my verdict. And quite frankly, the Asus ROG Swift PG27AQDM is very impressive when it comes to its overall gaming performance. Input lag, response time, refresh rate, and of course its resolution all come together to provide a phenomenal experience for those people who want the utmost when it comes to hardcore competitive gaming. As a result, it gets my performance award. However, I can't wholeheartedly recommend it. I wasn't exactly blown away by its performance, and that's namely due to its subpixel layout. The WOLED technology, in my opinion, can't quite compete with the QD OLED technology, at least when it comes to providing a better effect when it comes to reading any sort of text. Equally, you should also consider the overall price point it comes in at, and also some of the other features that I've mentioned. Here, there are some other alternatives, be it OLED or not, that you should consider. Now, will be down in the description below for your own consideration. Now, I'd be curious to know what you make of this Asus monitor, and if it's something that you would see yourself buying. And of course, if you've liked this independent detailed review, definitely do consider dropping a like, subscribing, and hitting that bell notification. All of which would be greatly appreciated. As such, I've been totally dubbed, and I'll hopefully see you in the next one. Take care of yourselves, and goodbye.